Good morning everybody and welcome to our Sunday service. Thank you for joining us. It's good to have you with us this morning. Now this morning's message, I want to talk around the topic about the mark of the beast or the 666. You know, a lot of questions has been asked from a lot of different people. Questions like, should I take the Corona vaccine? Does that contain the mark of the beast? Um, if I take the mark of the beast, can I still be saved? Um, things like, are Christians going to be around when the Great Tribulation happens? Are we going to have to endure hardship on this earth? And I want to address some of these topics, or some of these questions rather, through this topic. Now, in Revelations chapter 13, we're going to spend a lot of time in this chapter. Now, we know the book of Revelation is the book that John wrote on the island of Patmos. John was exiled to the island of Patmos. It was, he was really uh, sent to the island in isolation. And there he received a vision from God or plenty visions regarding the end times. And John then records his visions in the book of Revelation. Now the book of Revelation written by John the Apostle is an a culmination of different events that has taken place and some events that will still take place. So there are prophecies that has been fulfilled in full and there are certain prophecies that still need to be fulfilled. So in Revelation 13 from 11 to 16 it reads as follows. Then I saw another beast come up from the earth, and he had two horns, like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast, who had a fatal wound on one of his horns. He did astonishing miracles, even making fire flash down to the earth from the sky, and everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived many people who belonged to the world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then he came back to life. And he was permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that everyone or anyone refusing to worship must die. Now listen to verse 16. He required everyone, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given the mark on the right hand or on the forehand. And no one could buy or sell anything without the mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. And his number is 666. Let us bow our heads and let us pray as we dedicate the service to the Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is given to us for correction, for discipline, for teaching. And as we read your word today, we thank you that we will receive revelation regarding the end times. Most importantly, Lord, that we will be ready to meet our maker. That when Jesus comes for his church and when the rapture happens, that we are ready to meet you. Thank you, Lord, that you will lead us, guide us as we strive towards living a life pleasing and holy, set apart for you. Thank you, Father, that your grace and your mercy will give us the ability to live a life set apart for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we need to be ready when Jesus comes. And that is the most important thing. You know, family, the Antichrist 
is a counterfeit. He presents himself as God, but he is not God. You know, the number, the Bible says, is the number of man, which is 666. Now, 6 represents the number of man. 7 represents perfection. And so the beast and the Antichrist carries this number 666, which is short from the number 7, which means at his very best day, the Antichrist, being a counterfeit, cannot match up to God. God is perfect. And that is something to celebrate and rejoice about. We serve a God that has given us victory and triumph over every attack from Satan. Now there are two primary reasons for the mark of the beast. The first primary reason is to brand people as followers and worshippers of the Antichrist. You see, the word told us in Revelations that every person on this earth will be required to worship the Antichrist. And if you refuse, you will be put to death. The second reason for the mark of the beast is so that no one could buy or sell. You see, if you refuse the mark of the beast, you will not be able to partake in the economy the world's economy. You won't be able to sell or buy anything if you refuse the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast then, when you receive it, or when one receives it, you'll be isolated and you will be able, you won't have freedom to worship who you want, to worship the living God. You won't have the freedom to partake in world economics. The Antichrist is represented in this portion of scripture as the beasts. Now there are two beasts that the Bible speaks about here in Revelations. The first beast is the Antichrist. He came up from the sea. Then a second beast comes up from the earth and that second beast represents the false prophet. Now there are many theories, many conspiracy theories around how the mark of the beast will be introduced into the world. And what I would like to do today is to set your mind at ease that you cannot receive the mark of the beast in ignorance. The mark of the beast will be presented and you'll be fully aware when it is around and when it is represented. Now many people have speculated that the mark of the beast is a microchip. It's an implant into your skin that transmit radio frequencies that will give them the ability to track you, to track your movements, your whereabouts, but also give you, give them all the personal details of you, including your financial details. Some have even given this chip a name. They call it an RFID, which stands for Radio Frequency Identification. And so then when this chip is implanted in you, you will be able to go to a shop and not carry a credit card or a bank card or even a phone. You can simply swipe your hand or swipe your forehead and people and you'll be able to transact that way. Another theory is that the mark of the beast is given in forms of a tattoo or a barcode that is given to you. You know today even you get something what they call an electronic tattoo which is or an e-tattoo which is not a tattoo that is put onto your skin using conventional methods with a needle and conventional ink, but rather e-tattoo is something that is given to you, implanted in, under your skin using technology that will allow them 
to put this tattoo on you and that tattoo is not always visible. And so it uses flexible electronic components such as conductive ink to put this tattoo on your body. Now, if it's a, if it's a barcode, if it's a chip, whatever method it is that the 666 or the mark of the beast will be introduced to the country, it is all done in the name of convenience. So it will be presented as something that will be to your benefit. All your details are on there. No more going to the shop and getting to the tolls and finding, I forgot my wallet at home. No. You see, the mark of the beast will be presented to you as something that will make your life easy. The mark of the beast will also help prevent and predict things like terrorist attacks. It will eliminate identity theft. And as I said, it will give you financial security. You see, no one can then steal your bank card, steal your cell phone. And so the question is, can I receive the mark of the beast unknowingly? The scripture says that he, which refers to the Antichrist, will force everybody to take the mark of the beast. Now, to my knowledge, if we just look at the coronavirus and we look at the, the vaccine, at, to my knowledge, no one is forced to take the vaccine. To my knowledge, if you do take the vaccine, you are still able to buy and sell and partake in the economy of the world. So therefore, just looking at those two criteria, the vaccine cannot contain the mark of the beast. And so therefore, for those people that have taken the vaccine, for those people that are unsure whether the vaccine contains the mark of the beast, let me assure you, the corona vaccine is not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast, in fact, does not yet exist. Is this the time that we live in where technology and technolo technological advances are preparing us for the end times? Is, it pre is the world preparing for the arrival of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast? Absolutely. We are living in those last days. You know, the Antichrist will do five things according to Bible prop prophecy. Firstly, he will establish a one world leader. Second thing is he will establish a one world government. He will also establish a one world economy. A one world religion. And lastly, you will establish a one world military power. And so those are the five things that the Antichrist will come to the earth to do. Now the Bible speaks about two beasts that comes forth. But it also speaks about a dragon. It says that the first beast, which is the Antichrist, received all his power and authority from the dragon. Now the dragon represents the devil. And so Satan will give the Antichrist all its power and all its authority. The Bible also then speaks about a tribulation period. It's called the Great Tribulation. Now the Great Tribulation is a period of seven years. And those seven years are split into two three and a half year periods. And really those three and a half year periods that it is split into is where the first three and a half years is where the Bible says to us that Israel will be restored. And so there will be a peace treaty that gets signed with Israel. And that peace treaty is supposed to last for seven years. 
But after three and a half years, that peace treaty will be violated. And so the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation will be intensified. And people alive on this earth will endure great distress, great, great hardship, as it is the Great Tribulation. Now the Great Tribulation is described in detail in the Bible in a number of books. Zephaniah, the whole book is dedicated to the Great Tribulation, the description of it. Isaiah 24 also speaks about some of the signs that you will see in the Great Tribulation. In the book of Revelation, right from chapter 9 through to chapter 19, you will read about the end times and in there you will read about the Great Tribulation. But I want, to, I want to read something that Jesus said about the Great Tribulation. It says in Matthew 24 verse 21, Such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. And so Jesus here speaks about the Great Tribulation that we've never seen something like this before. We've never experienced hardship like this before. And never ever will the world experience that hardship. In fact, Jesus said, it is going to be te so terrible that if it was not stopped after seven years, it will result in the destruction of all life. You can read that in Matthew chapter 24 verse 22. And then the Apostle John, he states that the chaos will be so great that the leaders of the world will crawl into caves and cry out that the rocks of the mountain fall upon them. Revelation 6, verse 15 and 16. So it's going to be a terrible time to be alive, to be here on earth. Now, Bible prophecy is not given to scare you, but it's given to prepare you. And so the bottom line is that you and I, as believers and followers of Christ, we need to do whatever we need to do to be, a, to be ready for the rapture and not be around for the great tribulation. So the question then so how can we escape this terrible time here on earth as Christians? Are we going to be around for the Great Tribulation? And so to answer that question, I want to have a look at the order of prophecies, the chronological order of prophecies according to the Bible. What is going to happen next according to Bible prophecy? Well, the next thing, the next major thing, that's going to happen is the rapture. Now the rapture is when Jesus comes for his church. The word rapture is itself is not found in the Bible. But the word rapture speaks about being caught up or being caught up with as described in 1 Thessalonians 4. So we will be caught up with Christ and even those that are dead physically dead here on earth that have died in Christ will rise again and they will be caught up with Jesus in the heaven. For us to be caught up in the rapture, our relationship with God needs to be right. We need to live right. We need to live a life that's holy and separate and separated unto God. And so when Jesus comes for his church, on that glorious day, you and I will be taken in the rapture. Remember, Jesus speaks about a parable of ten virgins, speaks about five being ready and five not ready. Well, my prayer and I declare that we will all be ready to go in the rapture when Jesus comes for us. Amen. The second major event after the rapture has taken place will be the Great Tribulation. 
So therefore, you and I, as believers and followers of Christ, we would have been raptured. So we won't be here to endure this terrible time called the Great Tribulation. After the Great Tribulation, the third thing that will happen according to Bible prophecy will be the second coming of Christ. Now the second coming of Christ is different to the rapture. It's two different events. The second coming of Christ is where Jesus comes to earth with his church. Whereas the rapture, he comes to take the church. The second coming, he comes with his church to defeat the Antichrist. And that will happen directly after the Great Tribulation. That's seven years of hardship. The fourth thing that will happen is the thousand year reign of Christ and the church here on earth. It's called the millennial reign. At the end of this reign will happen the fifth thing, which is the final judgment. And number six, we will then spend eternal life with Christ. For those who believe in Christ, who accept Him as their personal Lord and Savior, eternal life happens thereafter. You see, friend, heaven is real, and so too is hell. And so eternal life is inevitable. It's going to happen. The question is, where are you going to spend your eternal life? So Paul teaches the coming of the Lord for the church in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 he says this and to wait for the Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead and that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Here Paul teaches the church in the book of Thessalonians that Jesus comes to rescue the church from the wrath that is to come. He's speaking about the wrath referring to the great tribulation. And here it's telling the church that Jesus is going to come, speaking about the rapture, to take the church away before the great tribulation happens. The mark of the beast will be given during the great tribulation. And that will take place after the rapture. So there is no ways that the mark of the beast is already here on earth to pre and being presented to people. Because the mark of the beast will be presented during the tribulation time. You and I won't be here. We will be raptured. Now, friend, the rapture, there is no way that you and I know when the rapture is going to take place. Jesus himself said, not even he knows, not even the angels in heaven, but only the Father knows when that time will happen. And the rapture will be in a twinkling of an eye. It will be very quick. It will happen very quick. When the rapture happens, there won't be time for you to go and repent. There won't be time for you to run to a pastor. There won't be time for you to go make right with your broken relationships, to ask forgiveness. The rapture will happen in a twinkling of an eye. You see, family, God is in control of end time prophecy. Only He knows. And so you and I, believers in Christ, we do not have to fear taking the mark of the beast in error or taking the mark of the beast in ignorance. We would be raptured. That is why Paul ends 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in verse 18. He ends that chapter by saying, comfort each other with these words. You see, because the church will be gone. It will be taken up by Jesus before the great 
tribulation. Now 1 Thessalonians 4 speaks about the coming of Jesus, speaks about the rapture. The Antichrist is also known as the man of lawlessness and he has not yet been released. He is held back. Let me read to you what 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 6 to 8 says. It says, And you know what is holding him, speaking about the Antichrist, what is holding him back, for he can only be revealed when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. Now God himself, through the Holy Spirit, is holding back the Antichrist. Now the Holy Spirit is embodied in you and me. Doesn't the Bible says that say that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And so we are the church. And so you could say that the church is holding back the Antichrist. And so when it's, the church is raptured, when the church is taken up with Jesus to meet the Lord, that is when the Antichrist will be revealed here on earth. Stop looking for the Antichrist. You know, some people, they look for the devil behind every curtain. Stop looking and focusing on the Antichrist, trying to identify him. Who can it be? We've over the years heard many speculations. Many men of God say that this president is the Antichrist or that president is the Antichrist. But the Bible says that the church is holding the Antichrist back and he will not re be revealed until the church steps out of the way. In other words, until the church has been raptured, the Antichrist will not be revealed. So the mark of the beast, when it's presented and it is taken by anyone, there is no repentance from that. There is no coming back from that. There's no saying, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Because as we've already said, the mark of the beast cannot be taken in ignorance. Let's read what Revelation 14 verse 9 says. It says, And a third angel followed them and said with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receive the mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which have been poured full, which had been poured out in full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise for ever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. There is no coming back from that. Heaven is real and so is hell, and the only way to avoid going to hell is by accepting Jesus. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. Now Matthew chapter 24 speaks about the end times. Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, speaks about the signs of the times of the end age, speaks about the great tribulation, the second coming of man, he also even speaks about the parable of, the, of a fig tree, saying that we need to look at the fig tree and we will 
know what season that fig tree is in. So too we need to look at the signs. But he also says, no one knows the date or the hour. You see, the Bible doesn't give us a precise date or hour. But there are signs that you and I can look at that will help us to get ready. Every single day, you and I need to live as if Christ is coming tomorrow. Because really, in the Bible, there is nothing pre preventing the rapture from happening. No one knows the date or the time. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 15, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will, dis will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live a holy and godly life. This is what the word says. Let me read verse 11 again. Everything will be destroyed in this way. What kind of people ought we to be? We ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of the Lord and speed its coming, that day will bring great destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt like heat. But in keeping with the promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Bear in mind that the Lord's patience will mean salvation. Just as our dear brother also wrote to you with wisdom that God gave him. Speaking about Paul, Paul wrote to us, with the wisdom that God gave him. But here it says, we look forward to his coming. So we need to make every effort to be spotless and blameless and at peace with Christ. Again, I want to say to you that Bible prophecy is not given to, to scare you, but it's given to prepare you. So that you and I can be ready for when Jesus comes. So as I move into my altar call, I'm going to remind you of the words that Jesus says here. He says, dear friends, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. So how do you come to a point where you're at peace with the Lord? A friend did by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You know, probably the most quoted and memorized verse in the Bible is found in John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came into this world not to condemn you, but He came to give you life. And so we want to pray a prayer. I want to pray a prayer with you. A prayer that is based on John, or rather the prayer that's based on Romans chapter 10 verse 9. The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 9, if you believe in Christ, that He is the Son of God, that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. In verse 10 of Romans 10, it says, with your, with your heart you believe unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So a public declaration is necessary, where you confess with your mouth, 
Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And when you do that, you start a relationship with God. His grace and His mercy will help you to live a life set apart for Him. God calls us to a higher standard. He calls us to live lives that are dedicated to Him. But friend, the reward is great. Accepting Jesus means that you will spend eternity with Him. During my message, I spoke about the fact that heaven is real and that hell is real. I spoke to you about the fact that eternity is a reality. The question is, where will you spend eternity? It will be in one of two places, heaven or hell. Jesus himself said, I am the only way, the truth and the life. He said, no one comes to the Father except by me. So why don't you close your eyes, bow your heads where you are right now, and pray this prayer out so that you can come into right standing with the Lord. Say, Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross. Today, I acknowledge that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Today, I commit my life to you. Thank you for accepting me into your family. Forgive me of all my sin. I repent and turn away from my old ways and I have today decide to follow you. Amen. Well, friend, if you've prayed that prayer, we are so proud of you. And I will see you in heaven. When the rapture happens, you and I will be taken up with the Lord. And so congratulations once again. As a church, we continue to pray for you. We are here for you and we are very, very excited about your new journey in Christ. Well, God bless you. Have a fantastic Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your week and we will see you next week.